So the second of today's talk is by Professor Gerald Roberts on earthquakes in Italy. Gerald is currently the Assistant Dean, or as we more usually call it, the Head of Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. He's been at Birkbeck about as long as I have, which is probably longer than either of us would like to mention. And he's, he works primarily on earthquakes in Italy, and he's going to tell us all about it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm half Italian, and my mother lived in central Italy when she was a child. And I remember as a kid asking her, you know, what can you tell me about our family? And one of the things she mentioned was that my great-great-uncle was killed in an earthquake in Italy. And I was probably about seven or eight when I was told this, and it stuck in my mind. I wonder why that's, wonder if that's weather, I wonder if that explains why I ended up working in Italy on earthquakes. And it was interesting because my mother said to me, but don't worry, we don't live in the earthquake zone anymore. So tonight I'm going to explore that concept of the earthquake zone. And do we live in earthquake zones or not? So the slides on the right here are from the L'Aquila earthquake that occurred in 2009. It was a relatively small earthquake. It, um, killed only 309 people, made 60,000 people homeless, and was a magnitude 6.3, so quite a small earthquake. But it did serious damage both to the cathedral, that's the slide on the left there, but there are uh, four cathedrals in L'Aquila which were very badly damaged. Uh, let me turn the lights down here, that will help you a bit right too. And also, the slide on the right is the town hall of L'Aquila, where all the plans for building evacuation and disaster response were kept, and it collapsed in the earthquake. So you can see that there's a, a problem. And what I'm going to do is show you um, quite a few slides of the damage from the earthquake to start off with, um, to give you a feel for it, and then try and explain how we might go about um, improving the resilience of the population and the buildings to earthquakes in the future. And these lessons hopefully apply worldwide so how do we increase the resilience from earthquakes, or resilience to earthquakes? Well, the, um, this slide here shows that there are 50% building losses. Now, imagine that, a, a town the size of Bath or York um, with 50% building losses in it. It was such a remarkable event that um, Silvio Berlusconi and Barack Obama got together in front of the town hall to discuss things at the G8 meeting few months after the earthquake. And for the local people, it meant um, many people living in these tent cities. For about a year, um, the Italian government has done a fairly good job of rehousing and there's now no one homeless a few years after the earthquake. But the memory of the 309 people who were killed, and this is the funeral for those people attended by the Pope, lives on. And I arrived in L'Aquila two days after the earthquake. I've been working in Italy for about 15 years before the earthquake, and it was a difficult time because I study earthquakes, and of course I didn't predict this one, because no one has ever predicted an earthquake. And as someone who, you know, who studies earthquakes, I find that upsetting. So um, it's quite a famous city because although it's known as a medieval city, there are plenty of modern buildings there. So for example, this is part of the modern hospital in L'Aquila, the hospital wing collapsed. Um, that's another view of it. Actually what happened was that the, uh, the hospital was built above an underground car park and the building collapsed into the underground car park. And you can see it's a fairly modern building. So one wonders if that was designed properly. Um, here's the poshest hotel in L'Aquila. I've stayed there a few times. I like you know, going to grand hotels. I don't think I'm going back to this one anymore. Okay, this was built in the 70s, so you'd think that one would be built properly. It obviously was disastrous in that hotel. This is a terrible story. This is the student hall of residence in L'Aquila. In this building, eight students were killed as they slept in their beds. Um, you can see one of them being uh, pulled out. And uh, this slide particularly gets me because uh, that's someone's hold on, that's someone's duvet. That's a bed. Okay, so you see how disastrous this was. So this quite modern building, steel reinforced building, um, absolutely terrible. And then you see buildings like this, which look okay when you first look at them, but then you see that there are these 
cross fractures, like these cross fractures here, okay, which actually mean that the pillars supporting that building have fractured and that's going to have to be demolished. So when you drove into L'Aquila two days after the earthquake, I thought, it's not that bad, isn't it? There's all these buildings still standing up. But of course they were damaged beyond repair. And so the total cost of the L'Aquila earthquake is so far something like 16 billion euros. Most of the uh, city is made of medieval uh, masonry buildings like this one, and they, they didn't do too well in the earthquake. This particular building, um, what happened was that the owner had um, put uh, an extra floor on the top. And somewhere in this photograph, just, I'll just turn around and, and see it. Um, see this thing here? That's a, an I-beam, a metal I-beam, which is a, a modern um, addition to the building so they could put a new story on the top. So you've got something very heavy on the top of a building, which is essentially stones held together with a bit of lime cement. So when that like, shakes, that's going to fall down, three people died in this building. This is another hotel I stayed in, and the hotel owner who I knew was killed in this building. So this is someone's house. You can see uh, some children's shoes just there. There's a football, and you see the whole uh, stairwell has fallen in. So these masonry buildings are not great. 50% of them fell down in the centre of L'Aquila. You know, it's still evacuated. If you go to L'Aquila now, you can't go into the centre of the city. It's cordoned off by the police. Remember, it's back in 2009, this earthquake. No one has moved back into the centre. And the main industry, well, not industry, the main way of making money in L'Aquila was tourism because of the medieval history of this city. And at present, you can't go in. Um, yeah, horrible pictures of masonry buildings collapsing. It's a church which has collapsed as a 13th century church. Um, there's a 14th century cathedral. There's another 14th century cathedral. Okay. Um, it was miserable, as this bloke definitely shows. When we were um, there at the disaster response, we were having to stay in some of these tent cities, and you can imagine people were not happy. Um, some of them were staying, this, is, I, this was an interesting one, this is a garden centre. They moved all the plants out and put a load of beds in for people to stay in. So that's what you're faced with after one of these earthquakes. Um, and now something really remarkable has happened. This is the, not the first time, but um, one of the few occasions where scientists have been tried and convicted for manslaughter. In this particular case, the judge on the left there um, decided that seven scientists, six of whom were seismologists, and one was just a, um, an expert in disasters in general, actually floods. That's the guy on the right. So he headed the Grand Risk Risks Committee, which is set up in Italy to sort of give advice on natural hazards and disasters. There was a public meeting before the earthquake because there were lots of small tremors in the days before the main earthquake. And the local people asked the Grand Risk Committee to turn up and give them some advice. And in the public meeting, excellent advice was given. The advice was, well, of course, you know we have earthquakes in central Italy. You will have been told this many times. And in fact, you have to have building codes when you construct new buildings. So you're all aware that you can have major earthquakes. But the tremors um, do not signify any, um, let, me, let me say this very carefully, because manslaughter charges <laughs> involved. The small tremors cannot be interpreted as a sign of extra hazard or less hazard, which is absolutely true, because seismologists have no idea what small earthquakes mean in terms of is it inevitable there's going to be a, a big earthquake afterwards we simply don't know the answer to that question so the advice that was given was excellent and the lights went on and what happened was that the gentleman on the right went outside and was interviewed on live television he was probably a bit tired and he said some things which essentially led to the manslaughter charges and um, he said Tremors in the weeks before the earthquake have released the danger, the stress, which is totally incorrect. 
A seismologist would never have said that. He's not a seismologist. That's totally incorrect. And the second thing he said was, there's no danger of a major earthquake. Go home and drink some wine. And he actually recommended this particular type of wine. No danger of a major earthquake when we know that in central Italy there have been devastating earthquakes. So what happened? On the night of the earthquake, people were woken by small tremors. They started wandering the streets. And the local police said to them, go home back to bed. Didn't you see the television broadcast? And there was a major earthquake and people died. And um, one particular gentleman who lost his wife and daughter um, was pressed charges and brought to everyone's attention this idea that the police had told him to go back to bed because of the TV broadcast. So therefore, as a direct result of what this gentleman had said. So they were convicted of manslaughter. It was very badly reported in the press. In the press, it said, seismology's on trial. And these people were convicted for not predicting earthquakes. That's totally untrue. They were not convicted for that. They were convicted for giving misleading advice. And there's no doubt in my mind that this gentleman said, um, no danger of a major earthquake, because you can watch it on YouTube. So very upsetting. I don't like talking about this because I know some of these people who were convicted. And um, the other six were fine. They gave absolutely perfect advice and yet they've been convicted alongside this, this gentleman. So how did they get into that situation? Well, here's a map of active faults in Italy. You, you may know that earthquakes occur on active faults like the San Andreas Fault in California. Well, here's, a, here's Italy. All these lines on here, these are all active faults. Lots of active faults in Italy. Not as famous as San Andreas in California, but lots nonetheless. And if we blow that region up, that's this. All these black lines are geological faults. This is a big mountain next to a, a, a basin in the mountains. So um, there's lots of topography across these faults. And that's an active fault. Some of them, we know when they actually broke in big earthquakes. That's the red ones. This is the fault which killed my great-great-uncle, 1915 earthquake. That's the one my mum knew about. But my mum thinks we don't... She thought that we didn't live in the earthquake zone anymore. She, clearly, I have not managed to communicate to her this map, which shows that there are all those active faults, and there's that whole history of red ones where we know which fault actually broke in which earthquake. I'll tell you how we know later. The thing on this slide is the green and yellow dots. The green dots are the dots, are, are small earthquakes which occurred just before the main shock in 2009, which ruptured that fault there, there's the 2009 rupture. And these green dots here, they're the, the, the micro earthquakes. So they led to a big earthquake. Small earthquakes lead to big earthquakes. But look at the yellow ones. Lots of yellow clusters of earthquakes, None of those led to a major earthquake. And I find this slide very scary. So this is going on today. So this is a real thing going on in Italy. This is in southern Italy, the city of Castro Villari, which is right there. It's got 23,000 people living in it. In the last year, they've had this terrible swarm of micro-earthquakes. And the two red things on there, they're active faults, like the San Andreas Fault in California. That's an active fault. There's Castro Valari, that distance is seven kilometres. If this fault breaks in a major earthquake, the city of Castro Valari is going to be in trouble. And do you think anyone's warned the people living in Castro Valari based on all these little earthquakes? No, of course not. Because, well, seven of them are in, um, have been convicted of manslaughter, and the disaster response in Italy is in turmoil because people are too scared now to speak out about what the hazard is because of manslaughter charges. So we've got to do something about this. We've got to educate the population that asking, what do these little earthquakes mean? It's completely the wrong question. And we need to think longer term and educate them about what better questions they can ask. I'm going to introduce you to those in this talk tonight. So, just to summarise what I've just said, 
Populations have not been educated to ask the right questions of seismologists. The common questions are, there's a swarm of earthquakes, does this mean a big earthquake is coming imminently? What do we do? Do we evacuate it or do we evacuate or do we ignore these micro earthquakes? And these are the wrong questions to ask because seismologists have no answer. We don't know what it means. Some do, some don't. That's the answer. Seismologists have failed to educate the population about the right questions to ask. And I'm a seismologist. So that's why you're here. Hopefully you're being educated about what the right questions are to ask of people like me. So uh, there's the questions at the bottom, which I think they ought to ask. And we're going to go through these one at a time and um, see if I can come up with any answers which might be able to help people. So we're going to start off with that first question. Does my area have a history of earthquakes? And of course my mother would say, yes, of course, but we don't live in the earthquake zone anymore. So let's, um, how would you answer that? Well, you look at the historical record. So we know that there's lots of earthquakes in Italy because of the plate tectonics. So here's a map of the Earth with the Earth's tectonic plates. The African plate is actually moving north and rotating because the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is opening. This is a mid-ocean spreading centre, so this is moving this way and northwards. These arrows show the direction that Africa is moving. It's crunching into Europe, and this red zone here is basically the zone of earthquakes. It's the collision zone between Africa and Eurasia. So we, we know there are earthquakes going on in here because the plate tectonics is showing you that. And my mother, I really should have educated her a little bit better that the African plate isn't going to stop moving in our lifetimes. Okay? It's going to go on for millions of years because it's been moving for millions of years. And there's a bit more detail on it. With, with, it's quite a complicated collision zone with this sort of curved zone here with the Alps, which are active faults in the Alps and then down through Greece, lots of active faults in Greece. And the North Anatolian fault in Turkey, that's an active fault as well. And in Italy, what's actually happening is the crust is being pulled apart as this there's a rotation going on. It's like um, the scum on the top of your bath water. There's lots of rotations involved in plate tectonics. And that rotation is causing Italy to pull apart with lots of extensional faults. And they're the faults that I showed you earlier on. You see the little box where that map comes from. So the, the black and red faults are faults which are pulling, pulling the crust apart. And every time that happens, you have an earthquake. So, what happens to those faults? So here's a picture of one of those faults after an earthquake. And you see the white stripe at the bottom. Well, the ground surface that this lady is standing on used to be at this level. And during this earthquake, which was a magnitude six and a half, the ground dropped from here to here. Not much, you might think only a few tens of centimetres. But of course the ground didn't drop just here, it dropped for tens of kilometres away from the fault on either side. So huge volumes of rock were moved during that earthquake. No wonder the ground shook so much. So that's, that's typically what happened. Let me go back one slide. So that, that picture there would be you know, along one of these faults. That's what they all look like. And we've all got these fault planes, in this case made of limestone, and many of them have these white stripes at the bottom showing there have been past earthquakes. Um, how many of them are there? Loads. Lot, all these faults are active in the way I've just shown you, with the ground dropping across the faults. And I'm just going to um, put the lines up a little bit, and I'm going to show you a little bit. I'm trying to wake you up, actually. <laughs> So I, I have a model here, which I'm just going to walk up there and show you what it is. It's a Perspex model with lots of metal blocks on it, with lots of springs connecting the blocks. And what I can do is I can wind the handle and tighten the springs, and you might be able to see some of the metal blocks moving. I'm just going to do it so you can hear an earthquake. So I'm going to, I won't be able to do this on it. Can you hear that? Please, someone nod. Yeah. yeah. So these are like earthquakes in this model. So I'll walk down and, and show you this. I'll try and talk louder as I come away. Basically, this is what the crust looks like. It's lots of blocks which are rigid. 
connected by springs, which are all being pulled along by plate tectonics. So if I find the wine in this handle, all oh, this will make all the earthquakes occur on rigid blocks. See that? It's an elastic crust in the earth with rigid blocks in between. And the that noise, that sound you hear, that's an earthquake. On sorts, yeah. Earthquakes are a release of energy in the form of radiating waves. I'm going to come back to this one. Uh, I continue to go on to sit. I'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> So that block relates to this map because the sliding surfaces with the sandpaper on those blocks are these active faults. And so, you know, that would be one block. And then between them, you've got rock, which is the Earth's crust, which is elastic. And the plate tectonic stretches the springs, in other words, stretches the crust. And then when the strength of the fault is reached, it slips under friction and gives off, well, sand from those blocks but radiating seismic waves in nature. So that's, that's a very brief explanation of what an earthquake actually is. So we have a very detailed record of when earthquakes occurred in Italy because of these amazing maps. These are what are known as Macaulay intensity maps. Um, these are not earthquakes you're seeing with these little symbols. Each of these is a town. So the different colours tell you how badly that town was shaken and damaged. In this particular earthquake, back in 1703, okay, so it's called the Macaulay scale, it tells you how bad the shaking was and how bad the damage was to individual towns. And look at the detail on there. All those are terribly damaged towns. Imagine those shaking photographs I showed you of L'Aquila and the damage. Every town on that map, which is red or orange, was at least as bad as it was in L'Aquila. Do you see how many towns were damaged in that earthquake? Absolutely terrible. Do you know how we know? Because of the Catholic Church. Okay, so this is Pope Clement the 11th, he's made here. So that, this particular earthquake damaged his house. Okay, he lived, um, where is it, there, Castel Gandolfo. Okay, so it actually damaged his house in 1703. He was responsible for collecting the taxes for the Catholic Church from central Italy. And, you know, people said, well, we can't pay, we just had an earthquake. So he needed to know exactly where the damage was in order to alleviate kindly the taxes for a few years to allow the population to recover. Okay, so the Vatican sends out people and finds out how bad the damage is in these historical earthquakes. And it's interesting that that city there, that's Rome. And that little insignificant little symbol there actually signifies that shaking of intensity 7 occurred. We know that because part of the Colosseum fell down. Two columns in the Colosseum fell down in 1703. And it's something like 70 kilometres from the epicentre. So we've got now a modern city, Rome, sitting within striking distance of these active faults in central Italy. So I'm going to show you a sequence of earthquakes. I think there are 21 earthquakes known to, in historical times. And I'm going to go through with these. Here's one in 1328. Each one of these symbols is a town. And what you're going to see is that there's a shotgun pattern of earthquakes occurring and in different parts of this map. So you're going to see damaged towns here and then here and here and it's going to be a pretty random pattern here goes 1349 1349 is a terrible year three big earthquakes in one year there's one there's one a few days later and there's one a few days later i'm oh, sorry these are on the same day aren't they i forgot about that these are all 9th of september 1349 three big earthquakes all magnitude sixes okay 1456 1461 1599, see how they're sort of like shotgun blasts all over the place. 1639, look at that. Two in 1639, 8th of October, 15th of October. Exactly the same place, I'll just do those two again. 
Isn't that amazing? So just because you've had a big earthquake doesn't mean you're not safe and out of the earthquake zone. Okay. 1654, 1703, that was the one that the Pope really got interested in. So I don't know what that banging noise is. But. Um, another one in 1703, another one in 1703, three in one year. They waited three years, 1706, another big earthquake. This is a scary map, isn't it? Don't you think? Every one of these is a town. 17, 17, Oh, it takes my breath away to see that particular map. That's the one that killed my relative. Look at, look at that. Nearly every town in central Italy is kind of red or orange. So every town in central Italy was almost as bad as L'Aquila was in 2009. And the local people think they're not living in the earthquake zone. My sister just bought a house in this area. And I tried to convince her she lived in the earthquake zone. And she says, ah, no, no, no. What, what do you know? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a pre professor of earthquake geology, actually. But that didn't impress my sister. <laughs> 1933. 1979. That was a horrible one, wasn't it? 1984. So um, does my area have a history of earthquakes? Oh, yes. Um, I suppose another question would be, uh, do I live in the earthquake zone? Yes, and the African plate's still coming. It's not over yet. You know, there are going to be more earthquakes. So then the next question would be, let's just check my watch, plenty of time. Are there sources of earthquakes close enough to my town to cause damage? Well, yes, you've seen that already from the previous maps. But um, so there's a question. So what do these faults actually look like? So this is what the faults look like. It's a beautiful place here, lovely place to go for a walk until I actually show there's actually, act, there's actually a fault here. Um, so these are Cretaceous rocks, that's the Cretaceous, and it's like this side, this height on this side of the mountain, and this side here, that's because this is a big fault plane, okay, which has down dropped the Cretaceous rocks by something like 500 metres over the last couple of million years. Um, I, can, I can see that, it's clear as day. But you see, if you're not a geologist, you're not going to see that. You wouldn't have any idea that that was there. Something that might be a bit more obvious to you, but I doubt that, <laughs> is the evidence of offsets in the last 15,000 years. So that's what Ka means, 1,000 years. Um, that's a fault which has moved about 20 metres in the last 15,000 years. The fault runs along here. Okay, let's show you a close-up of this. So that's what it looks like. So basically this surface here, which is covered in ash from Vesuvius, which has been dated at 15,000 years, is the same surface as this surface here, and the vertical offset is 20 metres. You know what, I'm going to make it easier for you. Um, let's say it's 15 metres offset. 15,000 millimetres of offset in 15,000 years means that that's moving at one millimetre per year, on average. Actually, what it does is it moves in big one metre slip events in earthquakes. But on average, it's one millimetre per year. Um, about 20th of the speed of the San Andreas Fault in California. So certainly less dangerous if you um, live there for a short time. Because the recurrence rate of earthquakes will be lower on this fault. Won't it? 20th, actually. But nonetheless, you still have big earthquakes. There's another one, okay? obvious in the landscape to a geologist, probably not obvious to you now, but if you were a lay person, like my family living here, you wouldn't have any idea what that is. And there it is, absolutely obvious, big fault scar. There's another one. Okay? So we know the faults are active because they've offset these slopes and they're covered in tephra, volcanic ash from Vesuvius, which has been dated radiometrically. You've heard of carbon-14 dating. This is actually argon-argon dating, but don't worry about that. This just tells you the age. So we know the faults are active. And another way we can date those surfaces is using cosmogenic dating. Oh, time to turn the lights up now, because that's going to take a bit of explaining. So, cosmogenic dating, we're all sitting here in this lecture theatre and we're thinking we're safe from supernovae. But actually, supernovae in our galaxy and all the other galaxies in the universe 
are sending out high energy particles across space, neutrons and another particle known as muon, a muon. Shall I say that again? Muon. These are whacking into us right now. Okay. They're coming in at nearly the speed of light, hitting the calcium in your bones. I'm looking around trying to spot the oldest person in the room. Because whoever that is has got more chlorine 36 in their bones than the youngest person in the room. Because what happens is that the calcium atoms are hit by these high energy neutrons and they split into chlorine 36. So we can actually date how long something has been at the Earth's surface by looking at the concentration of chlorine 36 as an isotope in, in calcium bearing rocks or bones. So the fault scarp that we were just looking at, here it is, it's the fault, upper slope, lower slope, that's this thing, fault plane here, upper slope, lower slope, it's been bombarded by cosmic particles. Okay, and we can tell how long the rocks have been at the Earth's surface by looking at cosmogenic dating. I'll be coming back to this slide. Okay. It costs a fortune. <laughs> the machine in the bottom right is a particle accelerator. You've heard of the one in um, CERN in France, Switzerland. We've got one in um, Scotland, the CERN, sorry, the CERC particle accelerator. It's quite a small one. It's the size of three football pitches. <laughs> in other words, it's huge. And the electricity bill every year is over a million pounds. So to run these samples costs about 4,000 pounds per sample. We'll be seeing more of that later. So we, we know the ages of these slopes, and we can get the slip rates on the faults. Remember I said 15,000 millimetres in 15,000 years? So we actually know how fast all these faults are moving. So we can now, now start saying how often these earthquakes occur. So we know there have been 12 magnitude 6s since 1349. There's been a few more smaller ones. So that's 664 years, divided by 12, that's how many earthquakes there have been. Every 55 years, this area gets hit by a magnitude 6 earthquake. 55 years, my family forgotten. That's terrible. Okay, and we can see which faults are ruptured by looking at the historical records. So this is the one that killed my relative. But the fault right next to it hasn't broken in historical times. But we can see from the offsets of the slopes that it is, has moved in the last 15,000 years. So it's going to have another earthquake. Isn't it worrying that that hasn't ruptured in historical times? The concept of elapsed time is very important with earthquakes. The longer that the elapsed time since the last earthquake, presumably the more dangerous that fault is. Think of the blocks I showed you with the springs. The more I pull the springs, the more likely there is to be an earthquake. So if I pull the springs a lot and it hasn't slipped, well, you know which block's going to move, right? So the elapsed time since the last earthquake is an absolutely vital information. And I'm going to come on to that later on. And I'll show you how to use cosmogenic dating to uh, get the elapsed time later. So are there sources of earthquakes close enough to my town? The active falls, oh yes, plenty of them. And actually, your town is surrounded by them. That's the answer you want to give to local people. Absolutely surrounded. How long have I got to prepare? 55 years, if you're lucky. Okay, because um, 12 earthquakes since 1349, 664 years, divided by 12 equals 55 years. And the damage from each of those earthquakes occurs, covers about 20 to 30% of central Italy. So it's, you're going to be lucky if you get to tens to hundreds of years without having an earthquake, and after that time, and this is a good word, inevitable that you'll have an earthquake. It's not probable, you know, I could tell you the probability if you like, it's a very low number in any particular year, but it is inevitable that you will suffer an earthquake. So better get ready. More about that later. How do I get ready? Okay. How can I make my buildings resilient to earthquakes? Because of course it's earth, the building which kills you, not the earthquake. I know, I've been out in, a, in an open field during a 5.8 aftershock to a lack of earthquake. I fell over in the 5.8 and was perfectly unharmed. 
might have been in the building, different matter. It's the building you need to sort out. So in some places we have records of what happened in major earthquakes. This is San Francisco, I took this picture this December. And what we've got here is a picture of a church which survived the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. And the hotel I stayed in, very nice hotel actually. Shame is made of cubes. Okay? Humans are obsessed with building buildings which are cubes. Look at this here. Okay? Very thin supporting columns okay, with corners on the buildings. That's the modern way of building things. Okay, so that's, that's how we build buildings. Okay. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> look how wobbly that is. That's a nightmare, isn't it? Okay, if any one of these corners breaks, okay, that building's coming down and the people inside will die. Okay, shall I keep going? Oh, look, you see it? It's broken. Okay. So the building's only as strong as the corners. Okay, so we're obsessed with building like that. Just like they were in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, so this is a picture taken in the few seconds after the Christchurch earthquake. It was a 6.3, again, quite a small earthquake in a modern city. And the dust rising there is the dust from falling buildings. <laughs> it's quite a terrible photograph. Gets me every time I see it, actually. You know, that's what happened to their modern buildings in Christchurch. Okay? See, see, that's a cube building. And what's happened is this. Okay, one of the corners is broken. So what can you do? Well, you do this. Okay, so this is exactly the same building. Look at that one. See, that's much better, isn't it? Okay, what I've done is put some little cross braces in. This is made with blue tack and lollipop sticks. Okay, and look how stable that is. Okay, and I can probably put something quite heavy on the top of that. And wobble it around. And okay, it's swaying, but you see how it's. Oh, I won't push this too far because it will break <laughs> eventually. But you see that that's actually much more stable. You get the idea? That doesn't. That's not beyond the wit of humans to build something like that. These cross braces, that's just broken. That's, that's annoying. <laughs> These cross braces can cost something like 15% of the building cost. Okay, so that's the price of a bathroom in an average house. That's not very much money, is it? I don't know about you, but I, I have a mortgage for a house. I don't have in my pocket 15% of the cost of my house to just spend on cross braces. Okay? If you want me to spend, or my family in Italy, to spend 15% of their uh, house cost on putting these cross braces in, we're going to have to convince them that there's a hazard and a risk I really hate it when people say that earthquakes are unpredictable. They're totally predictable. They're inevitable. So if you can convey that to people, that it's inevitable, they might spend 15% of their building cost on doing that. It works, you know. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to convince people to spend quite small amounts of money on their buildings. Um, there are simple ways that engineers can reinforce buildings. Okay, so we don't need to predict earthquakes, they're inevitable. What we need to do is convince people to spend money on retrofitting their buildings. And the only way to do that is for people like me to study earthquakes. Because somebody once criticised me, saying, oh, well, you're just trying to predict earthquakes, that's never going to work, is it? But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to raise awareness so that people build resilience into their buildings. Are there any ways that I can um, try and prioritise particular areas to spend money on? And this is dangerous now. I'm going to try and predict places which might be slightly more dangerous or slightly more at risk to prioritise for spending money. So some of the faults in this map have not ruptured in historical times, the black ones. And I've argued earlier 
but that means they've got a long elapsed time since the last earthquake and really we ought to be able to communicate that to people because it, it's intuitively uh, I hesitate to use the word obvious but it is to me that those faults are more likely to have earthquakes than the ones that have, that have gone red now we're going to do this, we need to measure elapsed time uh, it comes back to this the bombardment with cosmic particles see this red part of the fault here just underneath the ground and what happens is the particles come in they hit this surface and this has got some density it's colluded in other words it's gravel gravel which come off this mountain and accumulated on the slope like a scree slope if you like the particles go through this and they impact on this fault plane they whack into the calcium atoms make chlorine 36 and through time the chlorine concentration goes from this green line through the blue line through the red in other words the concentration changes through time okay so that is a record of how long uh, this particular part of the fault has sat just beneath the ground surface so if I can measure that chlorine concentration I can tell you how long that rock has been sitting just beneath the ground surface that's the elapsed time since the last earthquake because of course in the earthquake remember the picture with the white stripe this bit of the fault plane pops out of the ground doesn't it Huh? So if I can work out the time it's been sitting underneath the ground, that's the elapsed time. Brilliant. Okay, so how do you do it? You need a pickaxe and a shovel. Okay, so what we do is we dig trenches. So this, this picture is just here. So we, this is a shovel. And we dug a trench underneath the ground. And this um, white line here is a sample which we've taken with a rock saw. We hang off ropes with a rock saw. It's great fun saw off a bit of the full plane and then we measure the chlorine concentration by taking those rocks back and putting them into a particle accelerator and um, you obviously get somebody else to dig the trench this is my phd student yeah it's not true i don't i dig trenches i quite enjoy it actually gets me out of this place <laughs> which i love it here at Birkbeck. he said with the dean watching at the back <laughs> and so you dig these trenches and um, then you get in the trench. This is me with a rock saw. You see the fault plane? We've marked up the fault plane where we can actually take the samples. So there's the rock saw. And then as soon as you turn it on and you touch it on the rock, it gets pretty horrible in there. But anyway, you take these samples and you put them into a particle accelerator, measure the chlorine concentration. And then you try and predict what, what should the answer be. So uh, the answer is going to be different depending on how fast the fault is moving. Remember the 15,000 millimetres in 15,000 years, giving you one millimetre per year? Well, this fault's moving a bit slower, only going at 0.2. But for one millimetre per year, I can also predict that. So what I do is, because I know the production rate of chlorine at the Earth's surface, I can predict how much there ought to be in the subsurface. You know, it's not very much. The, the production rate of chlorine at the Earth's surface in one gram of calcium, one gram, how much is that? It's about the size of a, you know, a bit smaller than a sugar cube, isn't it? Every year, that piece of limestone would get 50 extra atoms of chlorine every year. 50 atoms per gram per year. And how many atoms do you think are in that cube of rock? billions and trillions of them and yet we've got to measure 50 so i can't do it any year if we wait hundreds of years the particle accelerator is accurate enough to measure the concentration of chlorine it's actually an amazing machine it costs a fortune four thousand pounds per sample so at one millimeter per year i can predict how much chlorine there ought to be in the subsurface there it is so we've got about 100,000 atoms per gram um, going down to about, what's that, I can't read it, now. three metres depth. And that's where we sample from, from the fault plane along this red stripe here. And then you, um, you measure it. What's the answer? And if your samples come up just to the right of that line, they will have waited longer in the subsurface than they should have done. That's the elapsed time since the last earthquake. The difference between the sample and the line tells you the elapsed time. Of course, if the if this samples occur to the left of the line, 
It means that the fault has had too many earthquakes. You know, like these faults which had um, two earthquakes in a, well, in a few weeks in the historical record? They do that, and like, they have too little chlorine. Whereas if they wait for longer than the historical record, they'll have too much chlorine, and we can measure it. So um, these graphs are, you know, how faults slip. This is time along the bottom here. This is how much a fault has, I can get it to work. This is how much the fault has slipped. So faults have, uh, my pointer's going here. Give it one more go. The horizontal bits on that graph are the, are the times between the earthquakes. That's how long the fault waited. The vertical bits are earthquakes. I think my point has come back to the vertical bit there. That's an earthquake. So we have this stepping, long recurrence intervals, rapid earthquakes, long recurrence intervals, rapid earthquakes. They don't come evenly in time. You know the model I showed you with the springs and metal blocks? These are data from that, that block model. And even if you wind the handle at a constant rate, you know, where Africa is moving north at a constant rate. The earthquakes don't occur um, perfectly in, at, at the right time. Sometimes they wait too long, sometimes they come too early. So sometimes the fault has got a lower rate than the average, which is this line here. This is lower, this red one, isn't it, than this average. Sometimes they're steeper, in other words, lots of earthquakes occur in one year. So we'd expect the samples sometimes to be to the right, that would be this portion of the curve. Sometimes the samples would plot over here to the left. That would be this portion of the curve. So here's some data. So this cost 0.7 million pounds to do these, get these data. Okay, so I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I spent your good taxpayers' money because this was funded by the Natural Environment Research Council on this stuff. Um, but 0.7 is very small compared to the 16 billion euros which one earthquake costs, so I'm not that embarrassed. And what these data have told me is that on many of the faults, the data are to the left, the data are to the left, data are to the left, data are to the left, data are to the left. All those faults have too many earthquakes recently. They're on one of the steep parts of the curve. No wonder, actually, because we know there have been 21 in, sorry, 12 magnitude 6 is in central Italy in, since 1349. Many of the faults have ruptured several times. And you have these clusters of earthquakes, you know, three in one day, of three in about three weeks. So the faults are ahead of the game, apart from one. This fault here is the data are to the right of the curve. There's the data, there's the prediction. Is that the next fault to rupture? So this is what we're working on, okay? What we're attending to do, and we're working with the Italian government on this, with the civil protection authorities in Italy, is to try and identify faults where the elapsed time is longer than it should be, and they're faults which are, the spring's been tightened, but the fault hasn't slipped yet. And this might allow governments to, um, you know, they have X billion pounds to spend on strengthening buildings, what do we do? Do we spend it evenly across the country? Or do we try and identify hot spots where perhaps the risk is higher? Because of course risk is, um, you know, you've got the geological hazard, but you've also got the exposure and how many people live there, how many buildings are there. So the exposure plus the hazard is the, times the hazard, is the risk. So should we spend the money on the places with the highest risk? So I reckon if we can find cities that are next to faults, which have got more than they more than they should have in the terms of in terms of chlorine, perhaps you spend a bit more money on them. So that's the idea. We're not there yet. Uh, we've just been funded again another 0.9 million pounds from the Natural Environment Research Council to carry this on to, to do more chlorine sites. We've got um, six sites so far. We're going to do 30 more. So you'll see 30 more graphs like this. Um, and we, you know which which faults going to go next? I know it's inevitable that all these faults are going to go, and in the next 55 years, it's very likely that all the towns in that area are going to get um, serious seismic shaking. 
but I might be able to pinpoint one which is perhaps a little bit more worrying. So are there any areas that should be treated with priority for building resilience in buildings? Yes. And we're not there yet, but that's what we're working towards. And you know what? We don't even get the answer. As long as we raise awareness and convince people to spend that 15% of their building costs, um, the science won't have been wasted, even if the science doesn't work. OK, so I'm going to stop there. same geographic area. The earthquake this morning in Iran is on the same fault system as the one uh, it was a few days ago. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. There was one today, yes. One I think it was last week. Yeah, they're on the same fault system. Um, you know, I wonder what the elapsed times were on those faults before these two earthquakes. I mean, were they anomalously long? It's a very simple question to ask, and uh, yet we don't know the answer because people haven't measured it. That's where I come in. Yeah. Um, can I ask, you're, su you're suggesting that um, the people who live in this area of Italy um, have the option of building their houses without the necessary reinforcement. Do they not have building regulations that insist on it? They do have a uh, building code. In, there's a European code for building, and it's different depending on the history of earthquakes you've had, so for example, um, the Gulf of Corinth in Greece has a more stringent building code than other parts of Greece because it has more earthquakes. So they have the, um, they don't have the option. <laughs> they have to build to the building code, and that's where the builders come in. My brother's a builder, okay, and he's never been. Okay, he builds in the UK. But it's not common for builders to actually be shown this sort of thing, you know, to show actually how do you actually make a building more secure. Um, also, you've got to enforce the building code. And worse, the buildings are already there. So by enforcing the building code, you only pr protect people who are building new buildings. So that's a very small percentage of the population. So really what you've got to do is raise awareness and people start retrofitting buildings. That's what's falling to bits now. Okay? Um, okay just, you showed us a lot of stone built buildings. Does it really only cost 15% of the value of a building like that to reinforce it? This is what I'm told. <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly sceptical of this. So the person who told me this was Professor Ross Stein, who's a professor at the United States Geological Survey, who chairs the Global Earthquake Model Initiative. So he has uh, all the major reinsurance companies in the world funding a big project to produce uh, a model of the Earth's earthquake risk. That's the number he told me. So let's ask Ross Stein. Brian. Yeah. Well, the faults with long elapsed times are um, really quite distinctive. Um, first of all, they're not that obvious. That's why we need to do chlorine. And they're obvious to Brian's a geologist, by the way. <laughs> he knows. Um, so to you and me, they're fairly obvious, but to the lay people, they're not. The rocks um, certainly are slightly different on different faults. But I can produce that uh, heterogeneity in the long elapsed time on some faults, not so long on others. In my simple block model, where the rocks are, you know, the blocks are all exactly the same, and yet it's a it's a natural thing within a, a chaotic system of faults interacting with each other that some wait longer than others. It's just natural within such a system. It's not. I don't think it's controlled by rock type. 
Let's see, hold a sec. That's right. That's right. Uh, is there any such thing in uh, the area? Right yeah, they have terrible liquefaction um, throughout the Apennines because the cities and towns are usually built on um, lake beds from the last time that we didn't have a glaciation on the earth, the last interglacial. Um, so, yeah, they have liquefaction. There's terrible liquefaction in northern Italy. Um, when was it there? Last year, in the Emilia earthquakes, which were 5.8, um, there were two of them, 5.8, 5.9, and um, this is on a bit up on the Po Plain in northern Italy. Terrible liquefaction there. Yeah. It's a big problem because it means you don't know, it's difficult to predict how much the ground is actually going to shake when the ground liquefies. Are you there? There might be a bit of a dark question, but um, I might be wrong with this as well. Um, I think like there's some um, uh, they got a bit better um, predicting volcanoes, sort of uh. not that reasonable, but I was just wondering if there's any kind of improvement on possibly predicting earthquakes in detail. Oh, I'd love to work on volcanoes. It's so much easier. <laughs> 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 because volcanoes go rumble, 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 explosion. Um, faults go absolutely nothing, and then they rupture. Or sometimes they go rumble, rumble, rumble. Um, and it's because within a, a volcano you've got magma moving from depths, which it has to happen before the eruption, and it takes time. So it's much easier to predict an eruption of a volcano um, with an earthquake. No one has managed to do it, and I think your question was, um, are, are, are we sort of as good? No, yes. we're, we're rubbish at no. predicting earthquakes. No, 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 we've got no idea how to do it on the short term, but on the long term I've just showed you how to predict yeah. earthquakes, I think. Oh, yeah. um, they're inevitable. That's a quite a good prediction, isn't it? That's exactly right, I think. Yeah, that's my perception of it. So how, how, uh, how are going about trying to change that? So the, I would say Italy is one of the better countries in the world for educating their population. So they have an institute of geology and geophysics and volcanology in Rome. And these people publish hazard maps showing the seismic shaking. In fact, all the slides I showed you of the, you know, the shotgun patterns of they're all from that institute and they're publicly available and they're doing their best to try and educate people of what the risk is and that's why seven of them have ended up with manslaughter charges so they're having a terrible time having people resigning from that institute uh, because of the court case unfair but there again the, did, the guy did say there was no danger <laughs> yes. So, I'm picking up from that phrase. Um, a lot of the countries affected by the Eurasian Fault are poor countries. So, I, I missed that lot. A lot of the countries affected by the Eurasian Fault are poor countries. Yeah. Iran, Iraq, running up through yeah. to Turkey, and what have you. 
Um, how do you educate countries where that really isn't a priority? Is there any sort of joined up thinking between yourselves and economists and that sort of thing? Well, the Natural Environment Research Council, which is our funding body in the UK, have just um, put aside £5 million for two projects to raise awareness uh, at risk populations. And the they specified that seismologists, for the first time, had to work with social scientists, scientists to, and um, political, well, governments, essentially. So we all had to try and write these projects um, where seismologists would talk to social scientists and civil protection people. We submitted these, and yeah, they funded two big projects, £5 million. Pounds. And this is a new initiative, I would say. Um, it's, that's happened in the last couple of years. So in the UK, that's, tr that's trying to happen. And this thing, the global earthquake model, with Professor Ross Stein at the USGS is doing the same. They're, they're trying to work with social scientists um, to try and educate populations. But it's hard. You know, if you go to uh, you know, a, a, a developing country where you know, they might be trying to spend their money on developing water resources or you know, they might have a civil war going on, um, it's going to be difficult to convince them to start doing something about their buildings because it's off in the future, isn't it? We don't live in the earthquake zone, is what you hear. So that's our job to tell them that actually you do. Well, why isn't London open? Well, um, the first earthquake, um, which is historically known in the UK, was recorded in St Albans uh, Cathedral by a monk in um, 1001 AD. And the shaking was thought to have come from the south because the bells in the Abbey rocks north to south and that's, that's a very nice historical record of an earthquake somewhere in the south of England recorded in St Albans so London south of St Albans Okay, I'd like to thank Gerald very much and invite you all to join us for the rest of Science Week